chapter 6. We're doing something a little bit different today. Um, normally I've been preaching in the mornings. Josh has been preaching in the evenings, going through Ephesians. It's been a blessing to sit under that teaching as well. Um, but this, we're going to be on vacation this week, uh, leaving on Monday, getting back the following Monday. And uh, so we will be gone next Sunday. And I don't know, what happens to me so often, I, I write these messages that I can't get through in once, one, one. I got spread into two. And I really hate to spread this over to where you hear the second part of it two weeks from now. So I'm going to preach this morning and tonight so that we can cover Romans 6, 1 through 11 here today and not leave you out in the cold. And I just don't have even a, a really good spot to stop here this morning. But I picked a spot um, that uh, hopefully will not be too you know, leave loose ends and so forth, but um, talking this morning about something you should know, okay? Uh, hopefully that's something, hopefully that's uh, appropriate for every message that gets preached from uh, pulpit of a Bible-believing preaching church, but uh, it's all something you should know. But that's specifically what, what Paul has here in mind in, in, in Romans chapter 6, which is, um, he wants us to know this, and he's anticipating some, some questions, if you will, or, or perhaps a wrong conclusion he's anticipating from what he has taught us thus far. So he kind of has a, a purpose here in mind, certainly has a purpose here in mind, as he transitions from an emphasis on justification uh, to an emphasis now on sanctification. One of the things he does here is he anticipates a question that would likely arise out of the doctrine that he had just taught them, which we read back here in chapter 5, verse 20. He taught all about justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. And the question would be this, are you saying, Paul, that since, there, since where sin abounds, grace much more abounds? See that verse 20 there? Look, look back at it. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound. Okay, so in light of that, Paul, are you saying that we should just sin more so that we can experience grace more? I suppose it's a legitimate question, sort of. I don't even think Paul hardly looked at it as a legitimate question. The way he answers, it's more like, okay, I'll say this, but I shouldn't even have. Okay. It, it should just be a no-brainer. It should be unthinkable that because of the doctrine of justification, we should go ahead and sin that grace may abound. So that's why he says in verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There's your question. The answer is, God forbid. Certainly not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? And then he continues on. So this is related to the antinomian thought that is alive and well today. Now that thought that says that since we're saved by grace and not by works, we just as well live as we please. We also have Arminians who would accuse those of us who believe in eternal security of handing Christians a license to sin. Uh, kind of, it kind of uh, maybe exposes a little bit of a motivation for their doctrinal teaching. They, they, it's sort of like we need to leave some sort of a motivation for believers to not sin. Because after all, if you sin, you know, once saved, always saved, then boy, then you just might as well go ahead and sin. But Paul's saying, no, not, not at all not the case. God forbid. So, to demonstrate that God has not merely saved us from eternal death, Paul continues on now to emphasize that he's also sanctifying us. In the last chapter, we call the different times of Paul contrasting the sinful act of Adam with the righteous act of Christ. He used the term much more in reference to what Christ did and what he's accomplished on our behalf. In verse 15 of the last chapter, he said, much more the grace of God. 
In verse 17, he says, much more they which receive abundance of grace. Verse 20, grace did much more abound. So we're not just saved by the skin of our teeth, so to speak. We're saved that we might have abundant life. We're saved so that we might become more and more like Christ. Now, in one sense, believers are already sanctified. We call this positional sanctification. The word sanctified, like the word holy, means to be set apart. Believers are already set apart unto God and are considered holy in his sight by the blood of Jesus. Of course, there's a relationship here with our sanctification and our justification. Some people have looked at justification as just as if I've never sinned. Well, if you are just as if you've never sinned, believe me, you're sanctified. You are set apart from sin. And unto Christ, because your justification and your righteousness is in him. You are sanctified. You are set apart. If you're in Christ. In Christ, we believers are already as sanctified as we'll ever be. In that positional sense of the word. But we also know that there's a practical side of it. We might call it our progressive sanctification. We all have to admit that in practical terms, we are not holy. I mean, okay, like positionally, we certainly are. I'm not trying to take away from that. And hopefully, in our practical life, we're becoming more and more holy, but we're not entirely holy. In practical terms. We're not fully set apart. We are not entirely sanctified. We are not sinless. We know that as we grow in Christ, we will sin less, but we are not sinless. So again, this is our progressive sanctification. That's why we call it that, because we're, we're on a journey toward Christ's likeness. We're progressing toward that. That's our goal as believers. Christ has enabled it. Not until we see him will we actually be like him. We'll see him as he is. What a glorious day that will be. Then we will have practical sanctification along with our positional sanctification. We will be glorified. So it's this progressive sanctification that is what Paul is addressing here. That's his theme here in chapter 6 through 8, really. So there will be times when I will just use the word sanctified or sanctification. Just know that I'm talking about the progressive side of it, okay? Uh, because that's what Paul's talking about. Progressive sanctification is the journey that all believers are on. If you're serious about your spiritual growth, you, you recognize that the Christian life is about it. It's, it's an intense battle because we'll be seeing here the old nature is still with us. It wasn't eradicated. And there's this spirit, sp uh, flesh spirit conflict that's going on. We're going to see more of that in chapter 7. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they all work together in a variety of ways, a variety of means to throw us off course and to stunt our spiritual growth, they, to stunt our sanctification. In Christ, you're justified, you're sanctified, sanctified, and you can pursue practical sanctification. So therefore you should. That's what God wants for you. That's the purpose statement for my message here this morning. God wants you to pursue sanctification. Now, what we need to really look at here is what we have in Christ, the resource that we have in Christ that leads to sanctification. Three truths you need to know about what you have in Christ that form the foundation for sanctification. This isn't all there is to it, but this is the, this is the things you need to know to, 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 to form that foundation for progressive sanctification. It's the starting place. After knowing truth, we must count it to be true and then act upon it. And we'll see that as we move along further after this morning. Or even after the scene. And the subsequent message is after verse 11. Well, 
Well, that was a long introduction, but let's go ahead and pray it out and, uh, and begin looking at what we need to know here. Father, so grateful for the Lord Jesus. Touch us with your truth. Help us to see and understand what you want us to know. That we will accept it as true. And just count it to be so and act upon it. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our, 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 our points that I'm going to be giving you this morning from this passage of Scripture do not sort of come chronologically in the passage. But the foundational truth you need to know as a believer is that when you accepted Christ by faith, you were baptized into Jesus Christ. That's what verse 3 tells us. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. The first truth you must know is that you were baptized into Jesus Christ. Again, we're talking about those who put their faith alone in Christ alone for their salvation. The moment you did that, you were baptized into Jesus Christ. So let's consider, first of all, what it means to be baptized into Jesus Christ. First of all, we can gain something just from the meaning of the word baptism. Of course, the, the one meaning that we're very familiar with is to dip or to immerse. That's the definition of baptism. This is the, the mode of water baptism that we believe is biblical. This is not just because the, of the meaning of the word. It is. But when you think about the meaning of the word, when you think about it being immersed or uh, dipped or immersed, we just believe that that's the best picture of what we are in Christ, in our identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And that brings me to the next really definition of baptism. It is, it is all about identification. We talk about um, oh, people's baptism of fire. Okay, The, the trial the difficulty they're going through. They, you, might, you might say they're immersed in that trial, that difficulty. I think a, a biblical uh, illustration of this would be a reference to Israel's relationship with Moses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye be, should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Baptism here speaks of Israel's identification or you might say their solidarity with Moses as their leader. Okay, so that's the word meaning, I guess, of the word baptism. Okay, um, we need to see what baptism is all about here now in this context. In the context of Romans 6, Paul is not talking about water baptism, but he is talking about our identification with Christ. Plenty of passages of scripture that would refute baptismal regeneration. Baptismal regeneration is the idea that you have to be baptized to be saved. It's not water baptism that places us in Christ. It is spirit baptism that places us in Christ. Now, no doubt Paul may have had, you know, water baptism in mind as that which pictures this spirit baptism, but spirit baptism is the subject. Again, some, some object to taking this passage as a reference to spirit baptism because verse 3 says it, it speaks of being baptized into Jesus Christ. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 makes it very clear that all believers are baptized by one spirit, by the spirit into the one body of Christ. To read it for you, it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So we really, we, we believe that both are true. That, that the spirit baptizes believers into the body of Christ and into Christ himself. Who is our head. So you need to know, you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, have been baptized into Christ. By the spirit of God. It's an incredibly rich doctrine for believers. Remember that Paul had just demonstrated to us that all human beings were in Adam when, when, when he sinned. 
and thus all sinned in Adam. We pointed out that this is not only fair, because people would argue that, right? They'd argue that, well, how can that be fair? One man sinned and we're all affected by it. We were in Adam when Adam sinned. It's not only fair, beyond fair, it is God's, of God's mercy and grace. Because as the whole human race was guilty and condemned in that one man, Adam, God can make justification possible for all men through the one man, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22. It says, For since by one man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall be, all be made alive. We talked to, looked at that passage last week as well. We recognized the different uses of the word all there and many and so forth. We we'll rehash all of that. But when a person accepts Christ as Savior by faith, the Spirit baptizes them into Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Old things are passed away, but all things are become new. Being in Christ means that we are identified with him in that which he did. It means more than that. But certainly it means that we are identified with him in that which he did. When he died... I died as a believer in Christ, as a, as a person identified with him. When he died, I died. What did Paul say in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When he died, I died. When he was buried, I buried. I was buried. Do you see what verse 4 says? Verse 4 says here. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. When he was raised, I was raised. Verse 4 continues, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I am now seated with him in the heavenlies, Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read verses 1 to 10 for you. This is a little longer passage, but such incredibly rich truths here. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly, heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's incredible. Paul is going to expound and explain all of this further in these verses here as we move along. The question is, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you thus been baptized by the Spirit into Jesus Christ? Perhaps you have accepted Christ by faith, and therefore you know you have been baptized into Jesus Christ. But you recognize all that you are in Jesus Christ. It's a know this, believers. You are baptized into Jesus Christ. And I, I encourage you to spend time meditating on that reality and, and, and thinking about the implications of that truth. You are identified with Christ. It's amazing. We'll talk about that just a little bit more here. In fact, maybe this is a good point to, to bring it up. There's a lot of talk today about identity, isn't there? It just seems that people 
had determined that they could be whatever they identified themselves to be. But it's all based on their feelings, not on reality. I just want you to know today that your identity in Christ is based on an absolute reality, an absolute truth. It is a real deal. It's not just a picture. It's not just an idea. It's not just something you think of as in your mind that you kind of are associated somehow. You are identified with Christ. I know it blows our minds. It's a spiritual truth that we can't fully grasp. But we are identified with Christ. We died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. We're sitting in the heavens with him. You don't think it was real when you were identified with Adam? Listen, we cannot deny the fact that we all have Adam's sinful nature. Listen, do not deny the fact either that you're identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have his nature. It's a new nature. It's a real deal. Not just a figment of your imagination or what you wish or hope was. It's based on real truth. The second truth you must know is that you are dead to sin. This is, goes right along with this. We already said that we died with Christ, right? We who are baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, verse 3 says. So what do you need to know about being dead to sin? When did it happen? We already talked about this, right? Verse 2, the word translated dead. Let's see what it says here. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Not as easy to understand here in English translation, but the word dead here is a verb. Um, in the aorist tense, it's in the past. It's indicating that at some point in the past, we die. And we know this. Before we trusted Christ as Savior, we had not died to sin. In fact, it was when we trusted Christ as Savior that we died. And yet there is a kind of retroaction, we've already talked about this, that takes place here. When we accept Christ as Savior, we are baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit such that we are in him just as we are in Adam. And thus are identified with him in his past, present, and future activity. As we already pointed out from Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, Paul is saying that when Christ died, he died. Same for you and I. That's when it happened. But what does it mean? Let me tell you first what it doesn't mean. I'll tell you what I wish it did mean. I wish it meant... That I, as it pertains to sin and temptation, was like a corpse in a funeral parlor, unable to respond to sin and temptation. I wish that. That's not true. That's not what it means. That's not what it means to be dead to sin. It doesn't mean that I can't sin anymore. I wish it did. This world in which we live, where we are surrounded by temptation, wouldn't it be wonderful if we weren't touched by that temptation? We couldn't yield to it. We couldn't sin. Some might argue, perhaps this is talking about our new nature. Our new nature can't sin. But yeah, but listen, our new nature has never died to sin. Never, our new nature never needed to. If you look down a ways at verse 6, it's actually our old man, our old nature that is crucified with Christ. See what it says? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. There are some that teach the, the eradication of the old nature. That Christians do not have competing natures. Again, I wish this were true. That would be wonderful. Well, one day it will be true. But it's not true now. I don't know how we can take that view in light of Romans chapter 7, verse 14 and following. That's those verses where Paul (laughs) 
says what we know, but the law is spiritual, black karma, so we don't understand. For that which I do, I allow not. For that, for what I would, that do I not. For what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. Now that it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I, you read that passage, I, I, it, it's so clear that Paul is talking about the flesh spirit conflict within his own soul. Some argue that Paul's describing the time before he was a believer. I just I don't see that here at all. Especially in light of verses 16 and 7. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's clearly talking about two different natures here. The I, he is talking about the dominant one. That's his new nature. But there's still that old nature with him and with you and I. Paul was not a believer. It was indeed he that did it. <laughs> not simply sin that dwelled in him. Paul viewed his new nature as the dominant force in his life. And thus looked at that as being him. But acknowledged that sin, that sinful nature, sometimes gets the upper hand. There are still others that declare that Scripture teaches that the old nature is not eradicated at salvation or at any time in this life. And thus the old man, in verse 6, cannot be referring to the old nature. The old man is crucified, but we know the old nature isn't. And they make a distinction between the old man and the old nature. I can't, I just can't see that distinction. In a moment, in fact, it's going to be not in a moment, it's going to be tonight. <laughs> I'll give you what I really believe there. That's why it's not a good spot to stop. <laughs> because I hate to have to wait till the night. The short answer is this. The old man and the old nature are the same. But being dead to sin doesn't mean you can't sin. It just means that the power of sin has been broken over you. You can choose to go back and serve it, that old nature and sin, but you don't have to. Power has been broken. That's what I believe it means in a nutshell. That we're, we're, we're dead to sin. The fact of the matter is, not only can I still sin, I do still sin. So being dead to sin doesn't mean that I can't sin. So we'll, we'll leave it there for now. We'll talk about more about what it does mean to be dead to sin here and look at the passage more in detail. But it's a tremendous, tremendous blessing there. I mean, it was sure to be wonderful if we couldn't sin. But it is tremendously wonderful that the power of sin has been broken. We don't have to serve it. And, uh, and that's what progressive sanctification is all about. So it's about, it's about that, that new nature becoming more and more the dominant force in our life where the fleshly, sinful, old man nature is more and more in the background. Um, but so often that's not the case is it, in our lives. We find ourselves in the flesh so much. And um, we're, not, uh, we're not counting it to be so that we are truly dead to it. And, 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 and recognize we do not have to sin. We, we choose to. We do. Unfortunately. Our, the old world, flesh, and devil chip away at us and we yield and we, we get in the flesh. And, uh, we don't have to. And that's a blessing. And the goal of all of this teaching that Paul's giving us here is to overcome that flesh. Walk in the spirit, not the flesh. And, and so forth. So We'll see more of that as we move ahead. Let's just close in prayer, shall we? Father, thank you so much for what the Lord Jesus has done for us and what the Holy Spirit has done in baptizing us into Jesus Christ. Thank you for this identification we have in Christ. That it's not just a figment of our imagination. Though we're grateful for it, it's not merely something we wished for or we hoped for or we wish it were that way. It is that way. 
It's a true and real spiritual fact that we are identified with you. When you look at us, you see Christ. You see Christ's nature. You see his good. We are justified. We are in him. We have his righteousness. We died with him. We're dead to sin. We were buried with him. We've been raised to newness of life. We have victory over sin and death. We're looking forward to the day when that, that is complete to the point where we are glorified. We are actually saved not only from sin's penalty and, and power, but from its very presence. So thank you for what Christ has done on our behalf. I pray that love for you would motivate us to really be seeking this progressive sanctification that you want for us. And again, we just thank you so much for making it available. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.